There you go. Well, somebody say, Pastor, I'm glad you're finally turned on. <laughs> Someone wise said, the future isn't what it used to be. Henry Ford was anti-Semitic, but he was a brilliant businessman who put America on wheels in the Model T. I don't know if you know when the Model T came out, it sold for $650. Within a couple of years, the price went down to $450. He was the first one to start an a, a assembly line the way we use them now. But one of his famous quotes is, if you always do what you've always done, you will always get what you've always got. Now, I want you to think for a minute. Consider that statement in the light of churchianity since the turn of the century. Some of the ecclesias, the, the called out church, some of the ecclesias' best hours were in the very first century. And I believe some of the ecclesias' best hours are straight ahead. They're about to kick off in our li lifetime. There's a greater prayer force now uh, than ever before, but we must listen to and do what God says. Thank God for Dutch Sheets. He has up to 40, sometimes more than 40,000 listeners listening to him every day and praying with him. Thank God for the prayer movement that's going on. But number one, if you're taking notes, Jesus did not religiously recruit disciples like the Pharisees did. The Pharisees were the most common, strict, and legalistic religious sect of Jesus' day. They majored on doing the do's and not doing the don'ts, but fell far short of impacting their culture for God. They even handed Jesus over to be crucified. They stood for rigid observance of Moses' law. Their aim was to, to preserve national integrity through strict conformity to the Mosaic law. With that in mind, they recruited the best of the best by their religious societal standards. They were after disciples with the purest pedigrees and the highest level of, of training. Jesus, on the other hand, invited people that society rejected to become his followers and his leaders for him. Those who proved themselves, even after multiple failures, were appointed to be movers and shakers in the kingdom of God. In stark contrast to this, scribes and Pharisees trained re recruits to be religious clones with a form of religion denying the power of the gospel. Jesus harshly condemned them, Matthew 23, 5. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. How many of you know where the word hypocrite came from? I see that hand. Three of you know where it came from. It came back when they were doing a lot of sculptures. And in scrupulous sculptures would find a flaw in the marble and they would, they would cover it over. And, and it got so bad that they started having experts would come in and, and inspect the sculpture. I'm telling you the wrong word. That's sincere. <laughs> wrong word. I'll tell you since I got you that far. When they were done, they, they would put sincere. The opposite of hypocrite. hypocrite. Sincere meant without wax. If it was stamp certified, it meant there was no flaws, there was no cover-ups in it. The opposite of hypocrites. But Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell, or Gehenna, as yourself. Number two, Jesus' call was and is to whosoever will. The Pharisees were only interested in those who would observe all their rules. They were looking for whosoever won't. Whosoever won't break the Mosaic Law. Whosoever won't eat with tax collectors and wine bibbers. Whosoever won't help a person in need on the Sabbath, etc. God in three persons never manipulates people. God calls and those who respond, he blesses. Those who, are, who refuse are left to their own devices. Number three, Jesus and his disciples were called, the Pharisees were driven. I know from experience, being driven by guilt, tradition, personal expectations, the expectations of the people around you, a desire to prove yourself 
is difficult and maybe deadly. Gordon MacDonald published the, the book, Ordering Your Private World, on December 31st, 1983. I, I put in there, you can uh, write that in or copy and paste it or do whatever you do, and it'll take you to where you can read most of that book for free. But I read that book in 1990 after the worst season in my career. I realized my whole Christian ministry was more driven than called, more pharisaical than spirit-led. My personal fall was precipitated by falling into association with strict fundamentalist religious people who were more concerned about their slant on doctrines, rules, and regulations, and who would they would or would not be caught dead with, than they seemed to be in actually helping people find their way in the kingdom of God. When Christians separate from other believers, they are in dangerous territory. I see that happening in Sturgis. Our, our Sturgis Ministers Association used to have 20, 25 people once a month. We used to pray together. We used to take, do prayer retreats. The last two meetings I went to, there were three men. Now, there's something neat about it. Last, last Thursday, I met with, with Luke from, from Grace and, and David from the Presbyterian Church. Vastly different than me, whatever I am, Pentecostal. And it was just so amazing as we started talking about the Word of God, how all three of us had studied it, tried to find more about God, got grown close. It was just really neat how that worked. But number four, Jesus strategized working through family and social groups. He wasn't that for the individual, though he cared for the individual. He wanted to work groups and win groups. Uh, John 1.43 the following day, Jesus want, wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law, also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. This is the best way to help people come to the faith. Jesus found Philip. Philip found Nathaniel and simply shared that little teeny bit that he knew about Jesus. And as might be expected, Philip met some resistance. And Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's common to run into religious mindsets when you share Jesus with people. Nathaniel was smart enough, yea, Nathaniel, Nathaniel was smart enough not to argue or become defensive. Jesus, get this, I want you to hear this. Jesus does not need us to, to defend his reputation. He can do that all by himself. But consider how Philip responded to his friend's skepticism. Philip said to him, come and see. Do you see the wisdom of this? Rather than arguing with Nathaniel, Philip just wanted his friend to meet Jesus. He didn't try to get him to join his church. He knew if he just pointed his friends to the Lord that Jesus could handle it from there. Jesus will do the rest. Every time you share Jesus with somebody, it might look like they're not interested. They might be mad. They might make fun of you. But any time you share Jesus with somebody, then it's up to Jesus to do the rest, and he will do the rest. Now, number five, I like this. Jesus struck up a prophetic conversation with Nathanael. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and he said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Now, that's interesting because he hadn't met Nathanael. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, Jesus had an advantage that he makes available to every spirit-filled believer. He gives us the ability to speak what the Father is speaking, which is very redemptive. All we must do is share the thoughts his Holy Spirit gives us. Now, if you lack confidence like I used to, you can say, well, I sense the Lord might be speaking this or so. Or you can say, judge this for yourself, but I'm hearing or sensing. But get the word out. Get the word out. Number six, uh, Jesus simply shared what God moved him to speak. We all experience this, whether we recognize it as God or not. 
we have a thought about reaching out to somebody or helping someone, simply following such impulses will make us evangelists quicker than any course on personal evangelism. Jesus did this. Uh, John 14, 49. For I have spoken, not spoken of my own authority, but the Father who sent, sent me gave me a command that what I should say and what I should speak, and I know that his command is everlasting life. In other words, when you speak that thing that the Holy Spirit puts in your heart to speak, uh, there's everlasting life in those words, unless you don't speak them. Jesus said, therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Number seven, Philip let Jesus do the talking and witness divine results. Can I tell you something? It should be easier for us than it was with Philip because we've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. We've been saved. He wasn't. But Jesus said in John 16, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own, own authority, but whatever he sp hears, he will speak. And he will tell you uh, things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit from his baptism, spoke the exact words needed to shift Nathaniel into faith. Every person sitting here can do this. We can speak what God's putting on our heart to speak to others. Look what happened. Nathaniel answered him and said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, King of Israel. And then number eight, Jesus took advantage of teachable moments. Jesus answered him and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open, the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jesus did not do things the way his religious predecessors did. He realized when God was up to something new and big with Nathaniel and with the world, and he wanted to move people from dry forms of religion to true relationship with God and the family of God. I was listening to you sing and worship and, and share and pray today. I hope we'll start to grow someday. But I'd rather worship with people that have a hold of Jesus than with hundreds of people that don't hardly know his name, have never cast out a demon, don't know how to, uh, how to, how to uh, prophesy. I'd rather meet with a handful than a large group of lukewarm people. Number eight. Now going on with number eight. There are some non-negotiables in the kingdom of God. Let me mention a few. Non-negotiable, winning people to Christ. Discipling nations. Healing the sick. Ministering to the poor and those in prison. Casting out demons and healing the brokenhearted. Unlike the Pharisees, you and I are called, and it boils down, we're called to love on people and help them. Religion and relationship crashed head on in and through the life of the ministry of Jesus. Jesus was more concerned that the hungry receive food than being bound by religious rules forbidding plucking the heads of grain on the Sabbath. He was more concerned about healing the sick than practicing proper distance from lepers. He was more concerned about a woman who spent all that she had on the physicians to try to stop her uncontrollable bleeding than he was in following the Mosaic laws of not touching a woman when she was menstruating. Jesus was and is more concerned about our bodies becoming temples of the Holy Spirit than building elaborate buildings to capture holiness within while excluding those who need God the most. We need to become more like Jesus and less religious in our approach to God and with people. Amen? Amen. But we have wineskins to deal with. The problem of wineskins, and I'm trying to preach through John, but this subject of wineskins is so important, it's in three Gospels, but not in John's Gospel. So we're going to read all three. I, I won't spend a lot of time. 
But the Matthew one first, no one puts a piece of unstruck cloth on an old garment for the patch pulls away from the garment and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wines or else a wineskin break, the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined. Now, now think of this, a wineskin was, was a skin of an animal, uh, pliable, stretchable, movable, and they'd put the, the juice in there and whatever they used to make it. And, and it would expand as it was fermenting. And then it'd go down and, and, and might, I don't know if, if, if in a goat skin, if it expands twice, I'll tell you another story later. But after that wine skin has been around doing the same thing year after year, uh, generation after generation, if you pour the new wine of Holy Spirit into it, the structure breaks and the wine and the structure is lost. And I, I heard a story about Peter leading a tour around heaven. And at one point they came to this large building with high fortified walls. And, and Jesus or Peter said, Shh, nobody talk while we're going by this building. So silently they walked, walked all around this building. And when they got way beyond it, one of them said, why couldn't we speak back there? Jesus says, that's where the fundamentalists are. And they don't think any, anybody else is up here. Same parable, um, Luke 5, 37. Then he spoke this parable to them. A, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, and we need to look for the meaning. No one puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear, and also the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. In 2005... I tried to bring an old wineskin, new wine into an old wineskin. Both were torn. The wine was spilled. The church broke up. I don't think I compromised with Jesus at all. But I wasn't wise enough to know that if you want new wine, then sometimes you have to step out of the structure that you're in. I wish I would have realized that sooner. And he goes on and says, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. Say new wine, new, wine. new wineskins. New wine. And both are preserved and no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new. For he says, the old is better. It isn't better. But he says it's better. So what was Jesus saying? It is fatally easy to become so familiar with form that we forget what the function of the ecclesia is really supposed to be. During the Jesus movement, thousands of young people were being saved just as they were without one plea. Long hair, sandals, tattoos. They were drawn to churches but were not welcome in many. Church boards um, worried that their carpets might be soiled with dirty feet. Pastors were concerned about charismatic excess. A great move of God was shut down because religious people valued the old wineskins more than they did the people God wanted to save. God help us. One more time, it was given in Mark 2. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment or else a new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else a new wine bursts the wineskins. The wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine, say new wine, must be put into new wineskins. Now, if the illustration of wineskins is so important that God put it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, don't you think we ought to ask Holy Spirit to enlighten us? In 1970, uh, Howard A. Snyder wrote The Probable Wineskins. I read it three times. The first time was three months after I started pastoring in Sturgis. My whole coming to Sturgis 
I had said, Jesus, I want to come into the real thing. I don't want to build on tradition. I want to build on the kingdom of God. I don't know if you remember, I wrote two books, Kingdom, uh, kingdom Thoughts 101, Kingdom Thoughts 201. I did not write them for the people. I wrote them for me because I wanted to find out what the kingdom of God looks like. Not what... I'll stop there. The second time was about five, five months after, or five year, years after I started pastoring in Sturgis. I was concerned that we were growing a mile wide and an inch deep. And we started doing some things out of the box and many were saved. But I read it again a few years later because number 10, we were becoming more concerned about form than function, just like the Pharisees. I question if we were becoming addicted to support groups. Boy, that didn't go over well. Unfortunately, we did not know how to fight corporate spirits of religion back then. I am thrilled that God is moving through worship on Sundays. I'm happy people are no longer bent out of shape by the flags or children actively engaging in worship in their own ways. I'm, I'm so thankful with that, for that. But I have to ask a question. But are we impacting communities where we work, play, and do our business? How effectively are we making disciples who follow Jesus? I read Snyder's book, Wineskins, while we were in L.A. and on our flight back home. Are we trying to protect what we are comfortable with? Or are we asking God, what do you want us to do for you and those you love in this hour? Jesus said, the gospel of the kingdom must be preached to the poor. Are we doing this? Are we preaching the gospel to the homeless? Or are we involved in a religious blame game? And I struggle with that, I'll tell you. We've tried to help so many people. Remember the young guy, that couple that came and we had a basket of abundance. People needed something, they came and got it. Well, the first, very first Sunday they were here, they came and got money to pay their rent. Next time their, their rent was due, they came and took money. I mean, several hundred dollars to pay rent. Third time they came, there wasn't any money left. And I said, I will not give you money, but I will make you a loan if you'll get a job. I called my son and will you hire this young man? And Eric said yes. Started work the next morning at 6 a.m. Quit that night. It was too hard. Later, his father-in-law called me. What are you doing trying to get? The I told him the story. At some point, your boy needs to realize that if he, he does not provide for his family, he's worse than an infidel. He has denied the faith. Dad agreed with me. He finally did pay me when he got his income tax back. So that, that puts a sour thing. And a few weeks later, he came back. I think I'm called to be a missionary. Would you support me? Absolutely not. Not until you learn to take care of your own family. I wouldn't think of giving you a penny. I will not support you. So I, I understand the reluctance. But if we don't win the poor... Who will? He said that when we feed the hungry, visit the sick or those in jail, we are doing so unto him. Are we doing this? He commanded us to disciple nations. Do you think he meant that? If us ethnic groups disciple them for the Lord. We need to seek God in this hour until we come into agreement with him and let him pour his new wine into new wineskins. And I, I don't know what all this means, but I believe that God wants us to synchronize with his wineskin for this hour so we can prepare for the new wine of the end time harvest he wants to release to us and through us. So I challenge you with a question. Will we let Jesus Christ be in charge of this church? Number 11, will we allow Holy Spirit to lead us all? All means all, and that's all that all means. 
Will we allow Holy Spirit to lead us all the way into his hopes and plans? God put this message on my heart the week before we went to Los Angeles to redig the wells of Holy Spirit revival. And I hesitate to mention this, and please don't use this against anybody. But many people who have come and gone, and I believe every mass exodus we have experienced since I came to Sturgis, has been the direct result of trying to pour new wine into old wineskins. And I want to share an illustration if you promise not to hold it against me. Promise? Oh, come on, let your yes be yes and your no, no. Gotcha. The Vietnam, quote, conflict began in 1995 between Vietnam, Laos, and, and Cambodia until the fall of Saigon on April 30, 1975. America entered it November 1964. Now, for the time reference, I graduated in 1969, but I didn't, gra I didn't turn 18 until uh, six months after I graduated. After the United States entered the, the Vietnam conflict, my dad joined with several others who argued that any 18-year-old that could be drafted and face death for his country ought to have the right to buy beer. And Dad was quite adamant about that. And Michigan dragged its feet on lowering the drinking age to 12. Now, I started school when I was four years old. I, I don't know why Mom wanted me out of the house so early, but maybe I can look back and understand. But most of my classmates turned 18 the year during their senior year. They could drive 18, 18 miles from, from Hillsdale to Pioneer, and they could go to the bar and they could buy three, two beer as much as they wanted to. And they did. People in my class were disillusioned. We feared for our futures. I worked for a farmer whose son was in Vietnam and sent horror stories to his parents every week. And too many of us were seeing acquaintance, acquaintances being sent home in, in caskets. I didn't know anything about God, but I knew I wasn't ready to die. And my age prevented me from giving in to the peer pressure of going to Pioneer, but the devil found a way to tempt me. Since I couldn't join my classmates in drinking 3-2 beer, I learned to make my own alcohol. I won't give you the recipe. But it took Welch's grape juice, it took sugar, it took yeast, and it took grape juice. And what you did, you put it on in a glass jar, and put a great big balloon over it. And after a while, the balloon would get really big, and then it would get empty again. And then a second time, it would get really big, and then when it shrunk down again, it was ready. And it could give you just a little teeny bit of a buzz and a really bad gut ache. I remember it still. My friend Jim, he wanted to follow my example. I was safe because mom never went into my room. Jim's mom cleaned his room every Thursday. So he made his wine and the balloon got big, but on Wednesday nights he would take the balloon off and cap it so his mother wouldn't smell the fermenting juice. One Thursday morning, she hit the jug under the bed with a vacuum. It burst. Grape juice half wine, all over the curtains, all over the carpet, all over her, all over the vacuum cleaner. His goose was cooked. And there's a point to this. Number 12, whenever we try to force what God is doing now into old wineskins, something's going to explode. And both the wineskin and the new wine will be ruined. Now a couple, couple ideas from, from uh, Snyder's book, Problem of Wineskin. Letter A, Jesus distinguishes between something essential and primary, the wine, representing Holy Spirit, and something secondary, but also necessary and useful, the wine skins. Wine refers to the work of the Holy Spirit. Wine skins refer to structures such as churches, evangelical, uh, evangelistic crusades, prayer church ministries. Old wineskins 
were the new wineskins when God began moving in the past. They cannot hold what God is doing now or what he's about to do. Letter B, new wine must be put into new wineskins. And this parable reminds us that God is always a God of newness. Isaiah 43, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the, in the desert. I, I got to prophesy here. There is coming a time soon when things will not be as we're used to having them be. And it's re going to require some shifting in how we do things. And... and I, I don't want to try to predict what's going to happen, but there might be times that where it won't be quite so easy to come into a warm church. It might not be quite so easy to, to get gas. It might not be quite so easy, but if that happens, God's going to have a new wineskin, and that wineskin might be your home, might be our home. It might be because God wants the fellowship of the church to become more more vital, more living than it has in recent years. Enough said. Now remember, there's nothing wrong with old wineskins. They were right for their times. I'm repeating this. But often the new things open the door to God's now thing. And whatever that is, is be the best thing for the time. And Jesus tells us, keep on knocking on the door until it's open. Keep on asking until the answer is given. Keep on seeking until we find. Number 13, John the Baptist was an anointed leader of the old wine skin. He stood on the threshold between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He was the last of the prophets in the strictly Old Testament sense. He was sent to prepare the way of the Messiah and to prepare the people of Israel for the coming of the Messiah, Jesus. He preached repentance in the Old Testament way of fasting, obeying the Old Testament law, and he preached repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. It wasn't there until King Jesus was fully uh, manifest. But remember, God had been silent for four centuries. Malachi's ministry ran from about 440 to 400 B.C. He brought a message of judgment in a very direct manner. He rebuked the sins of the people and the priest of Judah. And the priest had been derelict in their official duties. People were divorcing their spouses, marrying foreigners, doubting God's justice, judge, justice and neglected to pay their tithes. And God sent one disaster, one disaster another upon the land. And despite Israel's doubts to the contrary, Malachi keeps saying, God still loves you. But they did not respond to Malachi's message, and God said, okay, I'll be quiet for four centuries. You see, the prophet Malachi brought a message of judgment upon the people because they had not learned from the consequences of their past sins. He was very direct. Several places he makes an assertion, then he anticipates their objection made by those who hear him, and then he re refutes their rhetorical question. Malachi did that eight times in his book. Each time he uses the same wording, either but you ask or but you say. God is calling us to save this generation, this country, and the world. He is not calling us to condemn everyone and everything. He is calling us to do our parts in making everything new. Just like Jesus, when he tipped over the booze of the money changes, infuriated people who were far more religious than they were agents of change. Jesus, number 14, was and is the anointed leader of an ever-renewing wineskin. Though brought up in Judaism, Jesus put new wine in a new wineskin. Once Jesus began the, his kingdom ministry, the scribes and the Pharisees did everything in their power to discredit him. Same thing still happening. They even joined forces with political leaders to shut down 
or hinder his attempts to advance the kingdom of God forcefully upon the earth. That happened towards, towards COVID, and some of, the, some of the fastest growing churches since COVID are the ones that said, we will not shut down. I've already apologized. We didn't shut down the entire time, but we gave in to pressure for five weeks. That was wrong. I'll never do that again. If nobody comes, I'll be here. Jesus said about John, for, for this is he, John the Baptist, whom it was written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare the way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born um, of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. What an incredible statement. John was an incredibly anointed leader of the old wineskin. But Jesus has something better for you and for me. He wants us to follow his example as anointed leaders of the new and the now wineskin. Again, I don't know what that looks like. We need to seek God. But Jesus has something exciting and better for you, me, and our church and community. Jesus said, and I forgot the scripture, but I think it's Matthew 11 something something. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. That is Matthew 11, 11 C. Um, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent um, take it by force. We need to get rid of our peace sig symbols. And we need to take up our plows and beat them into um, swords. We need to stand up diligently and speak what God is speaking and do what God is telling and flow with however Holy Spirit it is leading. And according to Jesus, every one of you here is greater than John the Baptist because the king of the kingdom lives in you. Do you want to be part of the greatest revival and reformation this world, this country has ever known? Do you want to see the prayers answered that thousands of us are praying every single day, Monday through Friday with Dutch sheets? Do you want to see America stand great again by returning to the God of our fathers? Do you want to, to see real women breaking all-time scoring records in basketball than, rather than a he who wants to be a she. Despicable that a man would, transgender man would, would rob women of that chance of honor. We need God to do something, to pull our country out of the swamp. But just as much God needs his people to do something to keep our country from going down the drain. We have been waiting for God to save America. He's waiting for us, you and me. Till the time of John the Baptist, the people waited for God to move. Since the time of John the Baptist, God has waited for us to take up our crosses, deny ourselves, and do whatever it takes to turn the, this world right side up. At the end of every gospel and at the beginning of Acts, Jesus commissioned his disciples and offered a power promise for every true disciple of Christ so we can advance a kingdom beginning where we, li where we live and expanding through our cities, states, and nations, and, and the nations. Jesus calls us to walk in his power and promises until we complete his assignment. I'm just going to read that. I'm going to try really hard not to expound any more on these verses. Matthew 28, And Jesus spoke to them and said, All authority, has, authority is a right to act. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the the, the age. Some people are really predicting things because of the April, I think it's April 8th eclipse. And I, I've listened to some of them that are really interesting. 
Mark 16. And, and these signs will follow. Or does that say these signs might possibly follow? Will? will? Huh, must be they will if we will. These signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I'll tell you, I, I was, and I got to come up for the last part of it, but the anointing oil. I'll tell you, don't let that sit in your purse or your pocket or on your... Use it, use it, use it. When that little voice tells you to offer, and it's okay to offer and have people refuse. Sometimes people don't open up the first time, but offer to pray for somebody. Luke 24, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. How I wished I would have waited until I was endued with power from on high when I first started preaching. I've been in the pulpit for I don't know how many years, but way too many years. 20, 20 some before I was endued with power on high. John 20. So Jesus said to them again, peace be to you. As the Father sent me, I also send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, it's really funny. I was a good little Church of God preacher. And I started doing deliverance meetings and training. And I was at Grass Lake Church of God. I might have had another name too. But I was there. And, and people were coming up for, for healing and for anointing. And, and God told me to blow on this one woman. I, I argued with him for a while. But I finally gave in and I blew, blew on her. And she fell down. My first thought was, man, my breath must be horrible. <laughs> the very next person, God said, lay your hands on them. And I did, and they fell down. I'd never seen anybody slain in the spirit ever before. I'm not going to touch anybody. Next person, I just put my hands up, didn't touch, they fell down. See, God was trying to break me out of my religiosity to where I could learn to let God be God. And work in me and through me and through me any way he wanted to do. But anyways, I went home. I came home and I said, God, I'm never going to do that again unless you prove to me in the scripture that it's okay to do that. And he said, go to John chapter 20, 21, 22. Get out your Greek Bible and your concordance. And that word, breathe on them, puff of air. Okay, God, I'll do what you tell me to do. Acts 1, 8. But you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. If it was here. In, in Sturgis and, and Battle Creek and Kalamazoo. In White Pigeon. In Coldwater. Quincy, Bronson, etc. Um, and to the ends of the earth. And I preach this today. With one question in, in mind. Will you join me. In asking Jesus. For the power from on high to be his witnesses in this top, topsy-turvy world. I remind you that in the Acts when it said it wasn't the disciples that were saying they were turning the, rock, the world upside down. It was the religious people, the marketers, the business people, and so on and so forth. They were turning the, right, the world right side up. Will you join me in crying out for the power of God? power from on high to be his witnesses and turn this world right side up. If you will stand and we'll pray together. Father, we cry out for power from on high. To be your witnesses. Where we live, where we work, where we shop, where we play. Lord, we're taking hold of your coattail and hanging on. Not just touching the hem of your garment, Jesus. But grasping it and holding it fast. We won't let go. Until you pour your power out upon us. 
and through us. Because, Lord, we're not after what we can do. We're after only what you can do. And you're after us because you need to do it through people. Right now, in Jesus' name, I decree there's a joining of heaven and earth of God in three persons and the people of God standing in this place. We decree the new wine coming in as we just surrender ourselves to be new wineskins. Fill us, Holy Spirit. Baptize us fuller than we've ever known. In Jesus' name. And I bless you now with opportunities this week to use what God has spoken to you today. To speak what God speaks to you and wants to speak through you tomorrow and the next day. Father, we want to come into the fullness of what you are doing now. Thank you for your protection and your help in the yesteryear. But Lord, our eyes are fixed. Our eyes are fixed on the poor, the needy, the prodigal, the imprisoned, the sick, the destitute, the lonely. But Lord, most of all, our eyes are on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let us complete your will, your work, in your way. Bless us, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And my pretty wife is coming up here. Strawberries were on sale.